Pastor Austin, give him a warm welcome as he brings the word today. Yeah. Well, happy Palm Sunday, church. It's good to be with you. We're continuing in our series, and as we look at different people of the Easter story, Pastor Zach preached a great message. How many here last week experienced it? Man, how many were touched by just the Spirit of God and the time of worship and altar ministry? Listen, that is an opportunity that we have every time that you set foot in the church. We don't have to wait for a guest speaker. You don't have to wait for some, you know, just great awakening. You know, like we have the opportunity to worship God and he's worthy this morning. But Pastor Zach preached a great message. Go back and listen to it on YouTube if you missed it. But one of the things he said at the very beginning was that church should be fun. And he said it like six times. I was like, I got you, Zach. Okay. And so this morning I thought that we'd have a little fun. Now, um, peeps, I agree with Zach, with August, with Jeff, that peeps literally are the most disgusting Easter candy on the face of the earth. And there's two types of people who buy peeps, okay? There's people who genuinely uh, enjoy the taste of, of peeps, right? You guys raise your hands. Those people cannot be trusted, okay? <laughs> um, and then there's people who buy peeps simply for the sake of blowing them up in a microwave. And those people also should not be trusted. So uh, this morning, I thought it might be um, cool to show a YouTube video of blowing up some peeps. And then I thought to myself, self, don't be boring like Pastor Luke. Be fun like Pastor Weaver. And let's actually blow up some peeps. So would the lovely Vanna White roll me out a microwave this morning? Now, just by a show of hands, okay? Um, Yeah, we've got it. Man, this is great. Vanna, you look great today. (laughs) <laughs> How many have, have uh, never blown up a peep in the microwave? Good grief, you uncultured swine. <laughs> no, I'm seasoned. Do you know who says that? Uh, Mr. Potato Head, right, from Toy Story. Anyway, I'm not calling people pigs. I shouldn't do that. Hey, okay, anyway, um, peeps. These are some Dr. Pepper peeps, highly disgusting, and a microwave. And so we're going to zoom in if we can get the camera on here. I don't know if we can get the iMeg on the screens at all. We'll see how this goes. Put these little guys in there. Name one, Luke, Zach, August, Jeff, Brian. Perfect. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and push start. Are we zoomed in? Do we have it on the screens? No, we don't. All right. We're getting it. I don't know if you guys can see this. I probably shouldn't touch it the microwave oh my goodness oh my goodness can you guys see anything oh guys you guys are missing out this didn't work (laughs) holy smokes it's getting big oh this is fantastic I'm going to open up the microwave in four seconds three two one oh check out those peeps huh check them out anybody want to eat that no, you guys are, that is disgusting. If someone seriously wants this, they're welcome to it right now. I'm just going to, I'll just leave it on top of here. Go. Who wants it? Who's right at the front? Over here. Here's young people. Young people will do anything over there. Maren, take this back. Or Brandon or someone. Yeah, here you go. Oh, hey, just make sure you put the sticky on your dad's pants when you're done, okay? Not on the pew. Dad's pants. Hey, I just want to say if you're visiting this morning that you are safe and so are your children (laughs) and we're glad that you're here Uh, and microwaving peeps has absolutely nothing to do with um, my my sermon, but we are going to be talking about a very important person in the Easter story and her name is Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene and uh, uh, if you didn't know, there's actually seven different Marys mentioned in the New Testament. So that can get kind of confusing. It's like Mary one, Mary two, Mary. Yeah, anybody have like a friend named Paul and one's tall and one's small, so you call them like small Paul and tall Paul or something like that, or Mary one, Mary two. So probably the three most uh, famous or mentioned Marys in the Bible would be first, the the Virgin Mary, right? Uh, The mother of Jesus, Mary. And then you've got Mary of Bethany, and she's sister to uh, Martha and Lazarus and, and Mary of Bethany is the one who anoints Jesus' feet and anoints him and blesses him. And then probably the third most famous Mary in the New Testament is Mary Magdalene. Now, you might find it interesting that Magdalene is not Mary's 
last name. How many uh, other dads or parents in the room have seen the movie Frozen, right? And, and for whatever reason, I like preaching about Frozen. It just speaks to me. I've, I've danced to it. I've done a lot of things with Frozen. But um, long story short, Princess Anna, she's been locked up forever. She gets out of the castle, and then she gets engaged to Prince Hans, right? And Kristoff, the, the reindeer-loving, smelly guy that is helping Princess Anna in her quest to get Elsa, you know, he's, he's like, you can't marry a stranger. You don't even know Prince Hans. What's his last name? And she's like, of the Southern Isles, right? Like, <laughs> Prince Hans of the Southern Isles. That's kind of what's happening. If you don't follow that, don't worry. That's what's happening here in this story, is that it's like... Um, the, the, the writers of the New, Testament, uh, the, the New Testament of the Gospels are trying to distinguish between the different Marys. And it's like, this is Mary Magdalene or Mary of a town called Magdala. Now, Magdala, uh, we, we know a little bit about it just based on some Jewish literature. Um, the Talmud was a, a rabbinic piece of literature that the Jews would read and they would add and contribute to. And it says that Magdala was primarily a Gentile city of about 44,000 people. Another piece of literature, um, Jewish literature, credited the downfall of Magdala to licentious behavior, meaning um, like behavior without moral restraints or sexual restra restraints. And so in the eyes of Jews of that time, someone coming from Magdala probably wasn't really viewed as being someone of, of worth. You know, it's just kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a dirty, icky town. And, and, and maybe you're here this morning and, and you say, I, I just don't feel worthy of, of being in church. Or, or you can't, God, you can't use me because of where I came from or what I've done or whatever. Can I, can I just tell you this morning that God is not concerned with where you came from. He's concerned with where you're headed. And, and there is uh, the same opportunity for you to experience what, what Mary experience and be used by God to be a, a messenger of the gospel, to be set free, to be delivered, to, to experience a radical love from Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. And, and that is the opportunity today, not just a generic call. It is a personal invitation to walk close with God today, and it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what you've done. And as we look at the life of Mary, we should have a, a hope well up in our hearts and, and anticipation of knowing that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and what he did for Mary Magdalene, he can do for you and me. Mary becomes one of the key witnesses of the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're gonna read about her, but before we do, let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I pray, God, that you would continue just to um, work in my heart and allow your spirit to just continue to, to mold me and shape me and develop me into um, what you would have, God, a, a pure reflection of you. And so as we look to scriptures, as we look to the life of Mary Magdalene, I pray, God, that, that you would convict our hearts, you would search our hearts, that your spirit would speak to us, and most importantly, that you would draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you can turn in your Bibles to a couple of different places, Luke chapter 8, 23, 24, and John 20, okay? We get excited about the word of God at New Hope, and uh it's interesting that all four of the Gospels, what are the Gospels? It's the books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those Gospels, those books of the Bible record the life and the ministry of Jesus while he was still on earth. And I'm going to be reading from Luke primarily, but um, there are parallel passages. I'm not sure if they got on the screens or not um, but uh, I'll try to read those off. And all four gospel accounts give us this, this whole picture of who Mary Magdalene was. So if you're interested in that, I'll, I'll shout those down. First, Luke chapter 8. And this is uh, right in the middle of Jesus' ministry. He's been going around. He's been healing people. He's been feeding people. And this is the first account in the scriptures of Mary Magdalene. Verse 1, you can follow along 
on uh, the screens. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12, who are the 12, right? His closest disciples, his brothers, his band of brothers, right? The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Diseases. Mary called Magdalene, right? Mary of Magdala, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. And these women were helping to support them out of their own means. It's the first mention that we have of Mary Magdalene is that she was with Jesus during his ministry. Before the cross, before the the burial, before the resurrection, she was following Jesus. Let's jump to Luke chapter 23. And the the parallel passages are Matthew 27, Mark 15, and John 19. So if you want to go back later in your Bible setting and read those. But Luke 23, verse 44. And this is Jesus. He's been crucified. He's gone before Pontius Pilate, the Roman uh, ruler of the area who gave the orders to crucify Jesus on the cross. And here Jesus is, is on the cross. He's about ready to die. Verse 44 of Luke 23, it says, It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. What does that mean? That's kind of weird, right? It's like they were so internally disturbed that they were physically, you know, like just upset, right? Verse 49, but all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So in Mark's account, it actually lists the women, right? So we know these women who had followed him from Galilee, followed him from Magdala, a town near Galilee, right? So this is talking of Mary Magdalene. Jump down a few verses to um, verse 50, and this is again in Matthew 27, Mark 15, and John 19. Verse 50 of 23, now there was a man named Joseph. Remember, Pastor Jeff talked about Joe and Nick, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, the Roman authority, right? He asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, uh, one in which no one had been laid. The women who had come with Uh, Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So here's Mary. She's with Jesus in the beginning. She witnesses Jesus die, and now she's witnessing and watching Joseph of Arimathea take the body down and lay with her own eyes, lay Jesus in the tomb. Right? She's, she's witnessing these events. Luke 24, and the parallel passages are Matthew 28, Mark 16, and John 20. Verse 1, on the first day of the week, very, very early in the morning, the women, still talking of these Galilean women, right? Mary Magdalene, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wandering, Wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. And when they came from the tomb, they told all of these things to the 11 and to all the others. It it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. 
Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Okay, I, I want to read now from John chapter 20. I know this is a lot of scripture. But I think that as you look between the different accounts of the gospel, you begin to see the full picture of who Mary is. And I felt that John 20, so you're going to be with me. Everybody take a deep breath. All right. You got a weaver today. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1, says this early on the first day of the week. This is his account. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. John is like humble brag, right? He's talking about himself. The one Jesus loved, me, right? And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple start, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Another humble brag by John. He bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the, the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Verse 8, finally the other disciple, it's like finally, right? The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and he believed. Here's verse 9. This is interesting. They still did not understand. Who is they? Talking about the disciples. Talking about Mary. Talking about Joanna. Talking about these different people, right? They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back where they were staying, and now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Why is she crying? Be because Jesus is dead. She thinks it's over, right? In her mind, she's, she doesn't have the framework. She's not anticipating Jesus just popping out and just being alive, right? She watched with her own eyes him be beaten and speared and a crown of thorns on his head and, and, and killed and dead and the limp body coming down to Joseph of Arimathea and be laid in that tomb and the big tomb stone be rolled in front and this was her framework. She's crying because she thought it was over. She wasn't expecting him to be uh, risen from the dead. So she stands outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to the, look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head and the other at the foot. So this is where this is kind of catching up with Luke, right? Just a little bit more detail. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people that can speculate. We just don't know. We won't know this till heaven, but some people think that maybe Jesus came to earth in maybe a different body. Maybe it's that she'd been crying for the last 24 hours and her contacts were rolled up and she couldn't see really well. You know, we don't, we don't know exactly why she didn't recognize Jesus, but I'll just tell you for those who are praying for people that are lost or they're hurting or they're broken or they're away from God, that I believe Jesus is standing there and it's just taking them a moment to realize that Jesus is actually in the midst of their pain. These Jesus is actually in the midst of their depression. Jesus is in the midst of their addictions and, and, and everything that's going on. And just because your friend isn't recognizing Jesus in this moment doesn't mean that they're not gonna have a moment where they hear their name, where they recognize the call of the spirit that draws a man in, that draws a woman in, that brings in a brother or a sister or an aunt or an uncle or a parent. I believe that Jesus is standing here today. And even if you don't recognize it, my plea, my, my beg for you is to open up your heart and allow your ears and your heart and your feelings to be sensitive to the spirit of God that would draw a man in, not out of fear, not out of judgment, but it says, in scripture that it is by your kindness that leads someone to repentance. 
God is not upset with you. God is not mad with you. He's not mad with your wayward son or daughter. He loves you and he's inviting you in to be in a relationship that is protective, that is holy, that is pure, that is life-giving. And that is what Jesus is offering today. And so Jesus is standing there. She turns around. She doesn't recognize him. And, and he says this. He asks her in verse 13. He says, woman, woman. Notice the difference here. Woman, why are you crying? She says, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put them. Oh, excuse me, that's verse 13. Uh, Verse 15, he asked, same thing. Woman, why are you crying? Verse 15, who is it you're looking for? And this is her. Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, Just tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And here's the most beautiful thing right here. Jesus said to her, she doesn't say woman, doesn't say hey you, says Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. See, I believe that today, God might be for the very first time opening up your ears to hear that the gospel the good news that you don't have to earn your way to heaven, that God loves you and he's got a purpose and a plan for your life. Maybe for the first time today, you're not just gonna hear a generic call of woman or man or you or, or that, but you're gonna hear God speak your voice. We, the first song we sang, half of you guys weren't even here because it was raining or you're talking in the lobby, right? It says, and I ran out of that grave. You called my name. The invitation to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is more than just a generic plea. It is personal because God wants to be intimate and close with you, with you. Verse 17, do not hold on to me, Jesus says, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things. See, in this moment right here, I want to affirm women pastors, women evangelists, women leaders. God chose the very first evangelist to be a woman from Magdala, from a Gentile city, from an unclean city. There is a place for women in ministry, and I believe that some of the most godly voices in history have been through women, right? And if you don't like that, you can build a bridge and get over it. in love, (laughs) have a conversation with me. I would love to talk, okay? But we see that that, uh, this life of Mary Magdalene is very significant. So what can we learn about her, right? Why did we read all this scripture? Well, what do we know about Mary? We know that she was delivered from seven demons. Can, Can I just say this morning that spiritual possession and spiritual oppression is as much real today as it was back then? Okay, uh, you, your eyes might not be open to it, but there, there really can be spiritual possession. Daemon, daemonai zonai, to be uh, controlled by a spirit. That is possession. Now, I want you to hear me. If you are saved and you are a Christian, you cannot be possessed. Why? Because you were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and he owns you and your soul. But you better believe for a moment, as soon as you become a Christian, that you're going to have oppression. You're going to have, have you ever noticed the closer you step into God, it's like, boom, your air conditioner goes out, you know, financial times come up, cancer gets spoken into your life, whatever it is. That's, that's oppression, right? And we have to be careful and sensitive as believers that our eyes are wide open, that we're in tune with the spirit of God that would say, God, what am I allowing into my homes that it would not lead to more oppression, right? 
the enemy doesn't just show up and knock at your door and say, here's seven demons, why don't you just invite them into your heart and invite them into your life? No, he does it sneakily, he does it subtly, he just does it by this show and then by this music and by this opportunity and it's a slow drift that slowly those demons come in and they put their fingers right around your ankle and then all of a sudden, boom, they snatch hold of it and now they've got a stronghold in your life. They don't possess you but you've got an addiction that is holding you back from your future. You, you've got anxiety that is, you've got whatever it is that is coming alongside you and we have to be aware that oppression and possession is a real thing. God, would you open up our eyes right now and I pray in the name of Jesus, if there's any demonic spirit that is in this place that is preventing the words of the good news of Jesus Christ to enter their hearts, I pray in the name of Jesus that those spirits would leave, that no oppression or possession would be in this place in the name of Jesus. I declare it in faith, in Jesus' name, amen. So we see that she was delivered from seven demons by Jesus. We see that she supported Jesus's ministry out of her own means, right? What, what does that mean, right? Uh, she's, she's giving, she's serving. We, we, we don't know if she's a Jew. We don't know if she's a Gentile, right? It's possible that she's Jewish, just knowing where she came from, Magdala, or I mean, that she's Gentile, knowing that uh, she came from Magdala. It's possible that she's Gentile because she's hanging out with Joanna, Chusa's wife, you know, how'd you like to have that name? Chusa, hopefully nobody has that name. But I, that sounded really bad. If you have that name, I apologize right now, <laughs> okay? Um, right, he was, he was Her, or, uh, Herod's manager's wife, Joanna, and she's hanging out with these, these Gentiles, but also Luke recorded what? That she observed the Sabbath. So is she Jew? Is she Gentile? We don't really know about Mary Magdalene, but we know that she witnessed Jesus's death, we know that we witnessed his burial and where his body was laid. She was the first to discover that he had risen. She was the first uh, that Jesus showed himself after being rescued. And she is a key witness to the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. She is the first evangelist of spreading the news that Jesus is alive. But more than just all these quick facts about Mary Magdalene this morning, I believe there's two characteristics that are, are worthy of really focusing in, that are really, honestly, just have been so challenging to me this week as I've prepared this message. And the first is that Mary Magdalene was loyal. Like be, beyond words, beyond anything I've ever witnessed in my life, she was loyal. What do, what do I mean by that? Luke, Luke chapter eight, she's assisting Jesus with his needs. So this is during the ministry. And it would be, honestly, uh, that, that wouldn't be too difficult, right? Luke, Luke chapter eight, she's assisting Jesus with the needs out of her own uh, means. She's making sure that he had what he needed. Oh, you need a new tunic? You need some sandals? You need a meal? You need some money? What is it that you need, Jesus? I'm, I'm here for you. I'm following you around. I'm, I'm on mission with you. She's loyal to him in Luke chapter eight, but then you move to Luke chapter 23 and the heat gets turned up. It gets a little bit more difficult to be loyal. And what do you see? Persecution start to take place. And what happens to all the, the macho men disciples? I'll never disown you. I'm ready to die with you. All of them, right? And, and they're nowhere to be found. They all chicken out. And Mary is still there with Jesus to his death. Do you know that, that persecution probably is gonna come our way. Now, not in the way that we see it in Pakistan, not in the way that we see it in different places, but when, when persecution coming through like the, our social status at school for those who are still in high school and middle school, you know that you might get called an outcast, you might not be in the in crowd, you might not get invited to this, you might not get invited to that, and guess what? That's okay because Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. And it doesn't matter if, if you've got all of the friends in the world. What matters is, are you reaching and are you being a light in the darkness? Because when it is the darkest atmosphere that you're in, you shine the brightest. You have got a great opportunity, right? So she is being faithful in Luke chapter 23, but this is where it just really gets me. Luke chapter 24, she is loyal to serving Jesus even after his death, right? Luke chapter eight, it's easy. 
She's there when, when the 5,000 are fed. It's like, oh, free meal on you, Jesus? This is great. You know, she's been set free of, of, of the possession of seven demons. It's like, man, this is easy. This is so easy to be loyal to you because things are good. I'm watching miracles with my own eyes. I'm, I'm seeing deliverance. I'm seeing this. Then 23, wow, this is a little bit more difficult. Persecution is coming. Hey, where are you going, Peter? Where are you going, James? Where are you going, John? Hey, what about, what about Jesus? But Luke chapter 24 really is where this radical loyalty comes into Jesus. Why? Why do I, what do I mean that it's this next level loyalty? Mary was being loyal to Jesus even though at this point in her mind, Jesus was dead. What, what do I mean by that? Meaning that Jesus was never gonna give her another free meal. Jesus was never going to have that perfect word of encouragement in that moment. Jesus was never going to be there to, to have that warm, of, warm embrace and say, hey, it's going to be okay, Mary. I am with you. Fear not. Jesus, in her mind, in her thinking, she, she thinks he's just dead, deader than a doornail dead. And there's nothing that Jesus was ever going to offer her in this moment. That's what she believed, yet she was still Loyal, And the question that has been haunting me this week is this hypothetical question where if Jesus never did anything for you the rest of your life, if he never opened up another opportunity, if he never healed you, he never touched you, he never graced you with his presence and his peace again, if Jesus never did anything ever again for you in your life, would you still be loyal to him. That's a hard question. I think in life, we're so like conditioned to these uh, conditional, you know, relationships where everything is based on, on a, a decision of what's my return on investment, right? Like I'm gonna put in, in this relationship in hopes that, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. You know, men in the room, what would happen if your wife never supported you, encouraged you, respected you, was intimate with you, never did anything for you the rest of your life? Would you still be loyal to, to your wife? And women in the room that are married, if your husband never served you, never saw that need, never did anything else, you know, would, would you still be loyal to him? See, we're, we're just built around this conditional love. I, I've been having this lyric go through my mind from Matt Redman. He sings a song, we sing it maybe once in the contemporary, we sing it more in the blended, um, called Praise God. And, and it says, um, praise God, praise God, oh my soul, as the blessings flow. As the blessings flow, praise God, praise God, oh my soul, when it seems they don't, still I'll sing this song, praise God. Would you be loyal to Jesus if he never did anything to you, for you, the rest of your life? And if that's a convicting question, I'm gonna call us to repentance just like my heart has this week and said, God, May I never forget what you've done for me. Because you don't get to this point of radical, intense, next level loyalty just by pulling up your bootstraps. Listen, the key to loyalness is, is not just saying, I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna do better. There's gonna be more discipline. You know who could use more discipline? Me. I was drinking, Elizabeth, I'm tattling on myself this morning. I was drinking Dr. Pepper cream soda this morning at 545 because I'm, I'm exhausted and it's delicious, <laughs> right? This is not just a do better sermon. This is not just a try better, be more loyal. You gotta be better, you gotta do better. Listen, this, the, Mary's, Mary's whole uh, just drive behind what she did, I truly believe this, is a spirit of gratefulness, a spirit of gratitude. And that's the second thing that we observe from her is that Mary was so grateful for what Jesus did, it didn't matter that he was never gonna do anything else for her again. She was gonna be there for him even in death. I, I wanna ask you 
this morning, have you lost sight of what Christ has done for you? Have we forgotten the cross of Jesus Christ? We sang a whole bunch of songs. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life and brought me from the darkness. I can just imagine Mary singing this. You delivered me from seven demons, Jesus. When I was out of hope, when I was in the darkest place, when fear was overwhelming me, it was Jesus. And it's this radical encounter of the love of Jesus. Jesus didn't come up to her and say, you filthy person from Magdala. He came with his arms wide open and his heart wide open. And he says, Mary, be free. And from that moment on, she followed Jesus every day, every moment. It didn't matter the cost. Who knows what she had given at that point. She could have been broke following him around. She was loyal and it stemmed from gratefulness. Would you stand to your feet? Just close your eyes here and... God, would you speak to our hearts, Lord? Would you speak to my heart? I don't want to try harder. I just want to see you for you. God, I worship you. Jesus, I worship you for who you are and what you've done, God, and that's enough. If you never bless me another day of my life, God, you've already given me everything, Jesus. <laughs> you've saved me. You've promised healing in heaven, God. May we not forget If you're like me in this place and you'd say, Pastor Austin, it's really difficult for me to answer the question if Jesus never did anything for me another day of my life, that I would be loyal to him. And you'd say, today I need to turn my eyes back to the cross, back on what Jesus has done for me. And you'd say, I need to be reminded of who Jesus is. I need to be more concerned with who Jesus is than what my problems are. I need to be more consumed with what he's done than what I need. And you just say, I need a recalibration of my heart towards an attitude and a spirit of gratefulness. Would you just raise your hand all across this room and say, God, help me. Help me see you for you. Help me love you, not because of what you do, but because of who you are and what you've done. Jesus, help us and draw our hearts. And if you're here this morning and you say, I've never asked God to save me from my sins. Listen, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 said, it is by grace through faith. It is by grace through agreeing with what God says that a man is saved so that no person can boast. May we never boast in what we have done for Christ because it's not about that. It's not about anything. It's about Jesus and what he's done. And there is a free gift of salvation. And he's saying, would you come to me? And it's not just woman. It's not just man. It is your name. It is a personal invitation right now. And so if your heart feels inclined, you feel like the spirit is drawing you in. There is a God that is full of love in his eyes and mercy and forgiveness. And he's not concerned if you're from Magdala or the east side of Des Moines or south side of Des Moines or wherever it is. God is concerned with where you are headed. And today you have an open opportunity to 
to head to heaven with him where he is preparing a place for you, where he is getting ready for the greatest feast of all feasts and the greatest celebration of all celebrations. And so if you're here today for the first time and you say, Jesus, I'm stepping into the family of God. I trust your plan. I trust in your salvation. I believe in my heart that you died, that you rose again, and that you are here today. Would you just raise your hand and say, forgive me of my sin for the first time. Is there anyone here? Is there anyone here? Yeah. Is there anyone here? Thank you, Jesus. I see you in the back there. Is there anyone else saying, God, draw me in. God, I pray that you would save this individual, that he would be set free from any religion, that he'd be set free from anything that he has to do, God, that there wouldn't be the shackles of religion placed on him, but he would walk forward free in freedom, knowing that the victory has been won in the name of Jesus, that you paid the price when there was a price that we could never pay and that he did not owe, that you stepped in and you sent Jesus. And so we thank you for the blood. We thank you, God, for the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice. And in response, God, may we just lift our voice towards heaven. May we lift our voice towards heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's turn this place into a house of praise.